Welcome to Wild Turkey Science, a podcast made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow. I'm Dr. Marcus Lashley, Professor of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Florida. And I'm Dr. Will Goolsby, Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management at Auburn University. We're both lifelong hunters and devoted scientists who are passionate about hunting, managing, and researching wild turkeys. In this podcast, we'll explore turkey research, speak to the experts in the field, and address the difficult questions related to wild turkey ecology and management. Our goal is to serve as your connection to to wild wild turkey turkey science. All right, so we're back here with Dr. Chris Mormon from North Carolina State University. And as we told you last time that that you heard from him, uh, he was my major advisor. Uh, He also has done a ton of work with with, uh, some of our key management practices in the Southeast that affect turkeys, uh, namely prescribed fire, done a bunch of work, some of that work I was participating in. And uh, we wanted to have you on today, Chris, to talk about uh, burning and the timing of burning, particularly as it's related to nesting, because there's a lot of concern, and this is definitely one of those issues that creates some division uh, between people in, in our community that, are, that care about turkeys. So we wanted to, to go right to the source, because you've been a uh, party to a lot of the research, not just with turkeys, on, on several species, and we wanted to, to talk to you about that. But I was wondering, uh, we did, Will, and I... Uh, we kind of made a note of it in a previous episode that we wanted to talk to you about one of our hunting experiences. And I just made note that it'd be fun to hear your version of uh, the first, I think it was the first time we turkey hunted together uh, when you, it was during some of these, these research projects we're going to talk about. Uh, I was curious if you could tell us the short version of the story when, when uh, you used, I think it was my shotgun to shoot a, a big Tom. Uh, yeah, we were so, uh, <laughs> so I grew up in a time when there, I'm getting a little older, so I grew up in a time where there weren't really any turkeys or deer, at least where I live. So when, as a kid, we didn't hunt big game. We hunted doves and squirrels mostly. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, turkeys are around now, and uh, I have a project on turkeys on Fort Bragg Military Installation, and it's paired with a bunch of other projects on fox squirrels and white-tailed deer and coyotes. And, you know, we have a big group of students, and Marcus is doing – he's one of the students studying white-tailed deer. So uh, the wild turkey student is also there. So there's sort of a lot of integrated effort. And, um, you know, I'm maybe down there working with a wild turkey student, and Marcus is like, Hey, when y'all are done, do you want to go turkey hunting? Because it was maybe in between their deer trapping efforts or whatever. And I had never killed a turkey. And I believe Marcus has already killed his two his two birds state limit at this point on Fort Bragg. So he said he would take me out and guide me. And he had a bird marked that he said he thought was a good target. So we we got in there and set up. And um, lo and behold, turkey started gobbling in every direction. He goes, that's not the one. That's not the one. That's not the one that's not the one and turkeys are still gobbling. And he goes, Oh, that's the one. And I I think we might've heard eight different birds gobble that morning in every direction. And, um, Marcus is guiding me. He told me what tree to get on. He told me where the turkey was going to walk most likely. And he told me when the turkey was on the ground, because I was having trouble distinguishing when it was in the tree or on the ground, he told me to be still because the turkey was looking at us. And then I saw (laughs) its little head had popped up over a rise. We're in the sand Hills region, which has some topography. Um, I knew I was using his gun, which is, was, it was funny. The gun was huge in my, <laughs> to me. I was like, I felt like I was wielding a giant, uh, I don't know, tree and the, the bird. I mean, I knew when it was time to shoot and I just said, Hey, I, you got to stop him. And Marcus stopped the bird and I shot him. And, um, what was interesting is that, uh, while the bird was gobbling and maybe while it was on the ground coming to us, there was a somebody else another hunter had showed up uh, a couple of hundred yards away we we couldn't see him but we could hear him doing his crow call or his barred owl call with a crow call (laughs) and every time he was real 
Every no time he way. would do it, the turkey yes. would go, 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 go. And every he time he'd go. do it again and again and again, the turkey would gobble every it's time. Po- yeah, positive reinforcement. I guess and, negative uh, we, were, we were thinking, right why does he keep doing that? He knows where the turkey is. And luckily he kept doing it because uh, I shot the turkey. We ran over, got the turkey, turned around, started to walk out. And at that exact moment, he drove in right yes. to where the turkey was, which certainly he, he would, would never kill the turkey. Yeah, he would have bumped him. Like he, yeah, he, so he it was a matter of minutes. Within, yeah. yeah drove up to within 50 yards in a pine savannah where you can see forever yeah. <laughs> he drives up right i mean just right after the turkey. Yeah. So, so that's public land hunting so that you know it was a great experience but it was a it was an old it was apparently a mature bird long spurs everything great so it was exciting yeah. so just turkey. so just so i make sure i get i got the story straight he was using a barred owl's rhythm on a crow yeah. locator yeah. call it <laughs> literally sounded it was a crow call <laughs> yeah. and he was going <laughs> and it sounded like a crow. <laughs> maybe turkey, he's on. Maybe he's on to something. Yeah, the turkeys were just firing off in every direction. Yeah. You know, it was just one of those mornings, and yeah. it, and we were in kind of the honey hole, so to speak. And I knew a lot about the turkeys in that area because uh, I had been spending so much time with them. And uh, I forgot about that part, Chris. I'm glad you brought that yeah. in. I actually know who the individual was. You do. Uh, Yes, I do. I remember. What was the funny name. was that he was putting his turkey, <laughs> he was putting his camo on at his truck as we walked by with a turkey. I had a turkey hanging over my shoulder. So yeah. That was funny. Nice. Yeah. And Marcus I, even took it to the next level. Now, I was his PhD advisor, so he probably owed me. But he actually got back and he actually prepped that bird. He he did the full um, skin where he skinned out the whole back into the tail fan. So I still have that bird hanging on my wall. Yeah, with that that's full awesome. prep. People are always impressed with that. Yeah, nice. full like a caped it all the way out yeah. so it has the full thing all the way down to the neck. Yeah, I lo- I really like doing that with birds and you know kind of using them as as keepsakes to remember the you know different experiences. I I think they're beautiful and you know we try to use as much of them as we can. Yeah, the hunt uh, the hunt extends well beyond the harvest. So yeah, I love yeah. that. Yeah, I bet it was delicious too. Oh yeah, excellent. <laughs> I I hunt to eat mostly, so you know if it has if it has big antlers or long spurs, that's always just a side benefit. I'm there to <laughs> yeah. eat it. Well, uh, what we, one of the things that we noted, we I haven't told the story from my perspective, but I remember some a few things a little differently. You're going to say my <laughs> finger moved a bunch or something. I <laughs> so, <laughs> I was know, checking the safety. So <laughs> you, you can imagine being in, yeah, and this was that old Mossberg that we were talking about on. Oh, I think yeah. we talked about it on the air. I've got so, the same uh, one. Yeah, it literally is like seven foot long, the, the <laughs> shotgun in his hand. And, uh, you know, Chris wasn't used to that, I guess. Uh, I like a 26-inch barrel on my shotgun. So, yeah, yeah that was Well, this one's like a 32-inch <laughs> barrel with a, an extender is. for the choke. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, it, and it's got the rail on it. And it's just, it's just massive, it feels like. But, uh, man, I've killed a bunch of turkeys with that thing. If yours is like mine, it's got a nice rattle to it, too. Yeah, yeah. It, it uh... <laughs> It, it's been trusty though, man. I put that oh, thing yeah. to a beating for a long time, and it's oh, still yeah. been, been really reliable. So uh, I'll just tell a few little tidbits. So you imagine we're in a pine savanna. So we've gotten as close as we can because I already knew a lot about the birds, but we were still a couple hundred yards from them. You know when they were going to fly down, and we're sitting on this giant pine tree in the middle of the wide open yeah. on the side of a hill. And, uh, you know, we can, we would be able to see the turkey in some directions from hundreds of yards away. So I, you know, I was kind of sitting to the right of Chris, uh, sort of set behind him on the pine, but I'm looking across his face, you know, and he's got the shotgun kind of pointing down the hill and the turkeys are kind of diagonal to our left. So I'm looking across Chris toward the turkeys and I knew when they flew down and I saw those white cotton balls pop up there was two uh two long beards together and they popped up and that's when we started you know with i can see them they can see us you be still and i guess the that shotgun has a thumb mm-hmm. uh you know safety yeah. and you know the, meanwhile we've got the at first they were probably 200 yards away i could barely see them and then they were just i mean they're coming on a string right to us and chris is literally pointing to where they're going to cross in front of us at 20 yards he's already got a shotgun sitting there pointing at it and uh, we've got this big pine tree 
that they're going to have to walk behind. So he's going to be able to move or do anything he needs to right before they pop out. And, uh, I remember looking over it and I know that he was getting fired up and I could, you know, could, we could just feel, you know, how that feels when you like, mm-hmm. this is about to go down right now in the middle of this place. And we've got this dude over here that's trying <laughs> to screw it up. And they, you know, we're, we're like, we're just right in the moment. And it seemed like for an hour, you know, that all this was playing down. It was re- reality. It was a couple minutes, but I remember, looking over Chris and he was checking his safety to make sure he had it off. But I think it was a nervous habit because I remember saying, Chris, they can see us. Stop moving. Chris, stop moving. Stop moving. Chris, the safety's off. Stop moving. And then finally I was like, Chris, you know, just plain voice, Chris, stop moving. (laughs) <laughs> and I just remember, you know, from my perspective, I felt like he was just so excited. He couldn't stand it. And and he's breathing hard and everything. And it was just, it was so fun to, you know, especially with Chris, you know, like we're, we're out in the woods and the turkeys are gobbling and he's like, well, damn, did you hear that whippoorwill? Uh, and he's, he's like, shit, I got, I got 47 species of birds on my bird list. And I'm like, Chris, the turkeys are gobbling. Like, what are you, I don't give a damn about that. <laughs> About the I think they were Chuck Will's know? widows, and they were so loud yeah. we couldn't hardly hear it. We couldn't yeah, hear they, the it was just gobbling. it was amazing because the woods had l- just lit up, and Chris has heard every bird that is in the county with us. He's got them all on his list, mm-hmm. and uh, and I'm worried about one bird. You know, the turkeys are <laughs> goblin. So it it was it was a really fun hunt because you know that was I think that was the first time we'd ever hunted together, and it was fun to see what the different things that we key in on and everything. And, and it definitely made me appreciate the dawn chorus more, but, uh, I always remember looking over his gun where he's pointing kind of diagonal from the turkeys and, and seeing him check that safety. Cause it, it's really uncomfortable when you're with somebody else's shotgun and all that, but man, those things, they didn't worry about it at all. They just kind of came in on a beeline. They went in the strut a few times, you know, uh, just a perfect scenario. And then they walk behind the pine tree and he kind of adjusted to where he needs to uh, shoot. They walked out from behind it and I clucked at it. It stuck its head up and then boom, he just completely crushed it. <laughs> so, and then it was, it was pretty the, this easy. fella, yeah. <laughs> this fella comes driving up literally right after we pick the turkey up, we can see the guy coming down the the road in his in his uh his old van <laughs> <laughs> so really really fun time and and special experience i'm glad you still have that that cape so you can remember it sometimes but a lot of fun all right so now we've kind of lowered everybody's guard made, <laughs> made it a little bit of a lighter mood but uh chris you, you know this already and uh you know it kind of goes without saying but Burning during nesting, that that causes a, a visceral response from people, you know, turkey enthusiasts in p- particular. They get really, really, really upset with the idea that we'd ever consider burning during that time. Uh, I think most of them, most people agree that burning can be really beneficial to turkeys. But we wanted to come to you uh, because you've been the source of so much information related to this topic and just let you kind of lay out. Uh, you know, use of prescribed fire, what are we getting out of it? And then some of the studies, particularly that you've been the, the uh, lead PI on that concern the burn timing as it relates to ground nesting and some of these bird species. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. I think you, you, you touched on, uh, I think, where we should always start when we talk about fire and turkeys. And I think we need to uh, make it clear that prescribed burning is one of the most important management um, activities to uh, to improve, create, and maintain turkey habitat, if not the most important. Uh, prescribed yeah. burning uh, limits uh, woody encroachment into the mid-story. So when you have woody plants that move into the mid-story, they shade um, the vegetation near the ground. That's where turkeys live. That's where they nest, and that's where they raise their brood. So that vegetation near the ground can be important, especially for nesting and brooding turkeys. So fire helps maintain that. Fire can help shift that understory community to more herbaceous dominated community, which can be especially important for, for poults because they can get, um, that's where they can get a lot of bugs, the invertebrates they need 
Yeah, and that, I was going to say if you if you remember the episode that we did with you on the the uh, update, and then we've talked to several other people, nesting and brooding cover, and particularly brooding cover, seems to be dramatically limited or in low abundance across the landscape. And it sounds like it's the same there where you're yeah, at in North no, Carolina. Yeah, hundred percent. No, the thing about nesting cover is that turkeys will if you if you worked with turkeys and you've monitored their nest. They'll nest just about anywhere, but that doesn't mean that's really nesting cover. So when mm-hmm. turkey's nesting in leaf and pine litter, you know, in the middle of an open forest, that's not a great place for it to conceal its nest. So, sure. but, you know, brood cover is a much more specific requirement for turkeys and it needs to be that herbaceous community. So fire can really help us create and maintain <clears throat> that plant community. Mm-hmm. Um, there are other, you know, there are other potential values of prescribed fire for turkeys. Um, if you've, I've seen this especially in late dormant season burning, so burning in the late winter. Um, you'll see turkeys flock into those areas soon after the fires, when the, maybe even when the ground's still smoking. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're obviously going there because there's additional access to certain food resources. Maybe there's exposed um, invertebrates. Maybe they're exposed seeds or acorns or other things, but they mm-hmm. certainly are attracted to those areas. Mm-hmm. Um, so prescribed burning on the landscape is critically important to conserve wild turkeys. So, so when we, when we, when we raise concerns about burning during nesting activity, we need to be real careful because the first thing we need to always do is to recognize that prescribed burning is a critical management tool if we're trying to conserve wild turkeys. Mm-hmm. And we should never, ever let burning, uh, we should never let concerns about, to me, we should never let concerns about um, affecting turkey reproduction limit our ability to burn to maintain habitat. And I actually hear that from a lot of managers like, well, I, I'm not able to burn now because there's too much pushback um, on burning during certain times of the year because of concern about turkeys or some other animal. And that's, that's sort of frustrating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, to me as a scientist, it's frustrating because there's just not, there's, uh, there's just not much information that to suggest we should be concerned about burning during the nesting season um, with wild turkeys. And I, I can talk specifically about the work we did at Fort Bragg. Um, with wild turkeys. Um, so Fort Bragg is a, um, and this is where Marcus did his PhD work, so he can talk about it as much as me, but it's a, a large military installation that's managed with, with frequent fire to create and maintain a longleaf pine community. The goal there on Fort Bragg, and you know, we're talking 100 to 150,000 acres. Um, the goal is to burn everywhere at least every three years on average. So this is a heavily fire maintained landscape, one of the most heavily or intensively fire managed landscapes in, in the in North America, really. So it's a great place to study the potential effects on wild turkeys. The other thing that's sort of specific about Fort Bragg is they really try to do a large portion of their burning in their early growing season in April and May. And we all know that's when turkeys are nesting. So there's a there's a pretty high potential. Um for fire, you know, if you think there's a potential for fire to affect a ground nesting species like turkeys, that would be the place to, to, yeah. to study it. Well, let's let's reiterate. So you've got a hundred thousand plus acres where they're trying to put fire on every part of the ground at least every third year. Yep. And they are doing a large chunk of that burning during peak nesting time. So during we did a two year study on Bragg, and during that two year study. Um, they burn 20% of the base during the nesting season. Yeah. 20%. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that if, if it was a problem, that's where it would be. Yeah. So that's where it would be. So we did a two year study. Um, we located 42 nests uh, in the two years of that study. Um, but for, for some, for some logistical reasons, we only were able to include 30 of those nests in our nest survival monitoring. But of those 30 nests, only one was burned up. So that's about, that's a, you know, approximately a 3% risk of that turkey nest being burned up on a place that's managed as, in, you know, as intensively with fire as you'll find. Yeah, so um, some interesting year, things. So some yeah. interesting things we saw with those turkey nests. Um, turkeys selected for specific places on the landscape to place those nests. And what we saw was they were primarily selecting what we call the ecotone. So on Bragg, you have the uplands that are lonely pine communities that are managed with intense, you know, frequent fire. 
you have the lowlands along the streams and rivers that um, are moist and are less likely to burn. And then you have these ecotones, which are the transition zones from the lowlands to the uplands. And fire often backs. There's no fire break there. So the managers allow the fire to back into those areas. And so there, the soil is richer there. So the vegetation response is going to be um, more prominent and you know the vegetation is more lush. So what fire does is when it backs in there, it sort of creates this really nice mix of understory woody and herbaceous cover that's ideal nesting cover for turkeys. So they're selecting those areas um, over the uplands. But about, you know, I'd say, I think it was 10 of the 30 nests were in the uplands and the other 20 nests were either in those ecotones or in the straight up bottomlands down there mm -hmm. where it's wet. And the, the 10 nests in the uplands where prescribed fire is mostly happening, only one of those nests was burned up, but 0% of those nests survived. Um, so we, we can talk about that in a second. The ecotones in the bottom lands where the turkeys were selecting the nest, um, nest survival, I think, was 65 or 70% in those areas. So it was really wow. high. Yeah. Um, so there was a real interesting uh, dichotomy between those lowlands and the uplands. Chris, one question real quick before you move yeah. on with that. What proportion of the landscape was in that lowland versus, or, or ecotone versus the um, it's It's in our paper. It's like a, a 80% of the landscape is in the uplands, and the other 20% okay. is either in the ecotone or the lowland. So a large majority so you of had, the landscape is in the uplands. You had roughly, and, and uh, we're going to provide this paper in the show notes if you guys want to look at the actual numbers. Uh, so. Let me try to work out that math. You've got about 20% of the landscape associated with the lowland and the ecotone. About 20% of the landscape had about over 60% of the nests. Yes. Yeah. So it's what okay. we would call selection. So the yeah, birds are selection. disproportionately placing their nest in different parts of the landscape based yeah. on the availability. So if, if you just thought they were putting their nests randomly, if 20% of the landscape is lowland, 20% of the nest should be in the lowland, but it was a much greater number than that. Mm -hmm. Chris, yeah. do you think that they were selecting for those areas because the nesting cover was lacking in the uplands? Because I would expect those, you know, if they're burning on a basically a three-year rotation, that by the time those areas, you know, are two to three years post-fire, that, that should there should be pretty good cover in those upland areas as well, right? Yeah, so a couple of um, caveats here. So this is in the Sand Hills Physi Physiograph region of North Carolina. So the soils there are relatively poor. So vegetation mm -hmm. response post-fire is a little slower than you would see on more productive sites. So I, I think the nesting cover in the uplands probably peaks out certainly three years post-fire, maybe two years post-fire. And I call that a two-year or three-year rough. Um, and this isn't important. Unfortunately, we didn't document in what year post-fire um, the turkeys were nesting. So I, I'll talk about some other studies where we did document that, but I, I don't know exactly what year post-fire the turkeys were nesting. Uh, Marcus may have some guesses, but my guess would be it would be two and three years post-fire. Mm -hmm. The one year post-fire, the structure is just too sparse. Right. The other thing that goes on in Bragg is there's often efforts to reduce the woody component um, of the understory plant community, which is largely turkey oaks. So their, their efforts using techniques like herbicides to reduce that woody component. So even in some places you could go many years post-fire and there would still not be anything but wire grass and maybe some forb cover, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, that, you know, that turkeys was one thing. tend to like some woody component in their nesting cover. Yeah. That was one of the things that was kind of striking to me with my experience at Fort Bragg versus other places of the uh, the response, as you said, from the vegetation is not nearly as vigorous as it has been in some other places I've worked where, you know, by year two, like you burn and then, you know, two growing seasons later, I mean, it's a big mess of nesting yeah. cover then. And that's uh, not really structurally what I was seeing when I was there either. And I, I think you were right, Chris, from my recollection of going and looking at a bunch of those nests, uh, it was later on in the you know toward the end of the the return interval and even probably past it because there, there are areas that don't burn for longer than three years uh, just because they can't get to all of it or there's some sort of restriction or whatever so it could have even been longer since fire in some of those cases uh, where you have a little more woody cover development so just 
I guess I could summarize that study in relation to fire. Very, very, only one nest got burned up by fire, mm-hmm. despite the so, sort of aggressive uh, prescribed burning on that landscape. Well, and it, you know, the it's at a scale could, too. That it was at a large scale of burning, and it was yeah. in a large portion of the landscape, and a large portion of it was during nesting. So that's yep. the, you know yep. you would expect. So they're burning big. They're big burn units. There's a lot of burning, and they're they're focusing April and May. They don't just burn in April and May. So right. I don't want to say that, but that's a, that's a primary burn period because that's the early yeah. growing season, and that's when they get really good wiregrass response. Yeah. yeah. If I'm if I may, there's a couple things that I want to talk about here, and one of those is I think we just brought up a, an important management implication, and that's that you know we can make recommendations on fire frequency for landowners to achieve different objectives and they're they're really just starting points right because each each area is going to respond a little bit differently and on you know Fort Bragg for instance 3 years post fire you still may not have enough cover for nesting whereas i've seen places like in the black belt of alabama that the year after they're burned there's plenty mm-hmm. of visual obstruction from vegetation to to conceal a nest yeah. so i think that's important to point out to managers is you need to you know, familiarize yourself with what it is, what structure and species composition of understory vegetation you're looking for and start out, you know, with some baseline return interval when it comes to fire, but you have to modify that as time goes on yeah. if you're not achieving those results. When I, yeah, I'll, I'll go a little farther on that. Sorry, Chris. Uh, I, I've worked with fire and a lot of people, you know, have I've talked to over the years working with that. It's been a big uh, thrust of my programming. Uh, I've heard people get frustrated because we give a range of of things and we're not really specific on what. And Mm -hmm. I've been working really hard to try to prepare people to understand why there's range in those recommendations. What are the driving factors so that you can understand in your context how you vary these different factors? And it seems to be more helpful to people when you're preparing them to understand, okay, my, based on my soil productivity and my burn window and the scale I'm doing it and my objectives, you know, kind of tweaks those those recommendations. Whereas, you know, in the past, we may not has, have been as good at, at uh, articulating why we don't give a really specific recommendation in, in every case. Yeah, I agree. Um, and so I... We have some studies, I've, I've been involved with some studies of some other ground nesting birds that I think I could talk about that will, that we can use as, as sort of information to bring back to turkeys. Mm-hmm. But just to summarize that turkey project that we've been talking about, um, fire is, is common on landscape. Uh, fire to me was important in maintaining that really ideal nesting cover in that ecotone because without fire, those areas would grow up into mm-hmm. um, hardwood, mid-story stems. Uh, fire in the uplands where uh, woody cover was more sparse may have, you know, that frequent fire may have limited the nesting cover that was available to turkey. So you have to, again, you have to know your site and know your return interval to, to understand that. So what, even though, what about with brooding So even though cover, in the uplands, Chris? even though the turkey nests weren't being burned up, fire could have been sort of reducing that nesting cover in yeah. that specific landscape. Well, what, yeah, that what was, I was going to follow up with what about the brooding cover in the uplands? Do you think that it was more appropriate or, or better? From that fire regime there yeah it could be we didn't monitor that so it would be speculative Mm -hmm. but that's certainly possible okay yeah chris i think you you brought up an important point and it was one that was on my mind is that the the fire regime that they were using on that site may not have been conducive to maximizing nesting cover availability in the uplands and that's why we saw or you saw so many hens nesting in those ecotones um and so my immediate thought is a manager like if i'm trying to maximize turkey abundance i want to maximize usable space Mm -hmm. especially for things like nesting that are limiting across the landscape however you found that nest success was 60 percent in those areas which is almost like threefold of what we're seeing across the average study these days um and that's kind of hard to argue with and and furthermore the other concern that i had with turkeys nesting there is i'm thinking well, if these are on ecotones as you're transitioning into bottomland forest, there's probably a greater concentration of nest predators there. But that also didn't seem to play a role based on that 60% success rate. Yeah. Yeah, some of those. I, and so the, the question would be, are turkeys selecting the ecotones because there's nothing available in the uplands? Are they selecting those ecotones because they're just straight up 
high quality nesting cover. Mm -hmm. Um, probably the latter. The other thing is, is that, um, all those birds are in the ecotone and some of those areas are pretty wide. So they, they may not mm -hmm. as be as narrow as we might perceive where predators may have it easy, um, easy pickings. Um, but because those ecotones are sort of moist, sometimes, oftentimes when the fire backs in there, the fire is not complete mm -hmm. and the, 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 the nests that are in there may be less susceptible to being burned up by fire. Okay. And I think a take home message in addition to what we've already talked about and sort of understanding your vegetation response is if you can create, heterogeneity, variability in fire across your landscape, either burning small patches so you don't burn any big area, but also um, implementing prescribed burns where everything doesn't burn. And, you know, mm -hmm. Marcus can tell you, well, y'all both can say that in most cases when we do prescribed burning, we're trying to blacken everything. And mm -hmm. I just think that's not the best thing to do when we're it's trying to It's hard not to fall. Um, it's hard yeah. not to fall into that trap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've done it's it. Like, oh, look hey, at there's this. something that didn't burn over. Yeah, Let's go look put at some this patch. diesel fuel on it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, the, yeah. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to note, uh, you know, we've gone through a bunch of studies, as we've talked about, and Chris alluded to this at the state level, even in North Carolina, the the proportion of the landscape in this study, you still said was up in the 20% yeah. range, right? you know, that is good nesting cover. And that is, all, you know, nearly an order of magnitude higher percentage of the landscape than we're seeing at mm -hmm. the landscape scale which largely is attributable to fire uh, for one thing, but also that's another thing to keep in mind with that really high nesting success. There's also a larger proportion of the landscape in that, even though a lot of the uplands aren't usable in that case, it's, that fire regime is creating high quality or presumably high quality since the, the hens, they selected it and were super successful when they did, presumably high quality nesting cover in that landscape at far larger proportions than what we're observing in these other studies. Yes. And Bragg also does, you know, they keep their, they, the goal is to keep the forest open. So there's sunlight getting to the mm -hmm. ground. So those are, those things go together. If you just burn in a closed canopy forest, you're just throwing your money out the window. So you got to have sunlight getting through your forest canopy. And, and then that's where fire becomes important. Yeah. Well, Chris, I, I don't want to hold you up any farther. I know you've got some other good data so we, yeah, keep, so we keep just, going back to that one. <laughs> well, just so we, um, we've also studied a species called Bachman sparrow. And Bachman sparrow is a songbird that is associated with frequently burned lonely pine communities. And it nests and feeds on the ground and herbaceous cover. So it's a very fire adapted species. But it nests on the ground. And it nests um, at a similar time to turkey. So you would think, again, burning during the early growing season would be a potential risk to that species. And we tracked 132 nests um, over several years in North Carolina on Fort Bragg and also on some other properties in the southeastern part of the state. So over a very large region um, that included a, a variety of different public lands that were managed with fire. And we had only two of those 132 Bachman Sparrow nests that were burned up. So less than 2%. So just a tiny fraction. Two, so wow. this two out of that big number. So what the so you're like, okay, why are more Bachman sparrow nests not being burned up when there's burning in April and May and Bachman sparrows are nesting in April and May? And Bachman sparrows don't nest in lowlands. They don't nest in ecotones. They really? nest only in the uplands. So here's what happens. You burn in one year and then the next year, what I call the one-year-old rough, is the ideal condition for Bachman sparrows. So a large percentage of the Bachman sparrows are nesting in the one-year rough. So in other words, they're nesting and even though they're in the up when they are nesting in a part of the fire return interval where it's very unlikely for yes. fire to re-enter the system during the year that the nesting occurred. The only way those birds would be at risk of being burned up by fire is if you had an annual fire regime where you were burning every year. Mm -hmm. um, so even, you know, it sort of starts to, to peter off after that first year so there's still a lot of birds nesting in the two-year-old rough, and then there are very few birds nesting in the three-year-old rough. And on most of these lands, there's a three-year return interval. So when the burners are coming in in April and May, that's the, they're burning a three-year-old rough, and there aren't any Bachman sparrows there. Just to continue, we did a similar study with Northern Bob White, um, again on Fort Bragg, and we tracked you know uh, nearly 50 nests um, in a similar kind of landscape. Only uh, two uh only two northern bobwhite nests were burned up by fire again they're nesting bobwhite northern bobwhite nest on the ground um 
on Fort Bragg, Northern Bob White largely nest in the two-year-old rough. Now, if we went to a, a, a richer location like you guys may be familiar with, quail may be nesting in the one-year-old rough, but on Fort Bragg, they nest primarily in the two-year-old rough. So again, with a three-year return interval, Bob White are not susceptible to being, their nests are not susceptible because relatively few of those net birds are nesting in the two-year-old rough. Well, how, the, other, Chris, the other advantage that quail have in terms of that April and May burn regime is that quail nesting really picks up in June. So quail are nesting later in the, in the um, hmm. season. And if you're burning in April and May, you're just not, there's just very low chance you're going to burn up a quail nest. Yeah. Well, Chris, one thing I, I wanted to ask you, you, you were talking about this strong selection. I just wanted to get a feel for like how, how strong of selection for the Bachman Sparrow and the, the Bob Whites. Like, you, you know, I know that you said that they nest in the two year rough, but like what proportion, Ooh. like, are we talking about like 90% or 60%? You know, what is, how strong is that selection? Um, I could look that number up. It, it's, well, well, we'll provide the paper so they can get the actual number. Yeah, it's not, a- <laughs> it's not 90, it's not 90%. So there is some variability yeah. and even okay. some of the Bachman spares are nesting. They're nesting the same year as fire. Okay. So, so even when it's skewed, it's skewed to earlier or even less likely that fire enters than yes. later. Would you say that? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's so, really interesting stuff. So I, actually, I, I have the numbers for you here. Um, so for for Bachman sparrows, 70% of their nests are in that one-year-old rough, 20% in the two, and, and 7% in the three. Okay. So there's 7% of the nests that are p- potentially susceptible to being burned up. But even then, you know, the chance that the fire happens the same time the nest happens in the nesting season is pretty small. For Bob White, 50% of the birds are nesting in the two-year-old rough. 20% in the one, 20% same year, and then 12% in the three year. So the point is, is that on Fort Bragg, if you shift it to a two year return interval, you might put more nest um, at risk of quail. But again, the quail are typically nesting after, um, after the burn season. So, yeah. So Chris, can you say the ones that chose, how many chose to, to nest in the same year as fire versus the third year? For quail? Yeah, the ones it's about twenty percent just... in the same year as fire, and about twelve percent in the three year. Okay, and so of course, it... you, people are like, "Why? What are they doing this?" They're doing this because these birds are queuing in on the vegetation that's yeah. that's coming back after the fire. So this is all driven by the condition of the vegetation. Um, well, and you, that was yeah. the thing I was going to kind of get at is even in that case, if you even if you burn during nesting the or or I guess directly before it for quail they still would use that is making that space yep. more usable for nesting, at least based on those percentages than not burning because, you know, you're worried about nesting, which is kind of an interesting potentially, thing. The, potentially it probably depends on the timing of that same year's fire. If it was a dormant season burn on Bragg, that would have been several months mm-hmm. um, of green up that would have happened before they nested. So if you burn in May, they're going to have less time for green up. Sure. But they might, brood in or something else they, uh, yeah absolutely yeah so that's really interesting so chris it, it it sounds you know pretty clear from your data on northern bob whites on turkeys on bachman sparrows that on those particular sites there wasn't a high exposure of nests to to fires they weren't you know regularly destroyed but you know i have we have a lot of listeners that reach out to us that hunt large public tracts of land that send us pictures of burn up nest <laughs> all the time you know, obviously they don't have transmitters on birds, so they're just coming across these nests, you know, somewhat randomly. And for the number of pictures that they have, uh, it's almost baffling to me to think that this isn't occurring on a fairly regular basis on some sites. Can you think of, can you think of any combination of site characteristics that might lead to burning during that time of the year impacting more nests? Yeah, you could think of the worst case scenario where all the nests are concentrated in the in the sort of parts of the landscape that get burned. Okay, number one, the birds the birds are nesting at the same time burning is happening. So this would be burning in April and May during the nesting season. Large portions of that landscape are being burned every year, and I mean large, mm. uh, at least twenty to thirty percent. Um, 
there was one other point. I can't remember what I was going to say. But <laughs> <laughs> so large portions of the landscape, complete burns within those burn units. Mm-hmm. The birds are all concentrated. Oh, the other thing was is the return interval. So that the timing of the return interval is so that um, the the areas where birds are nesting in those burn units is the same time that they would be scheduled to be burned. So there are a lot of things that have to happen. Big area gets burned. The birds are all concentrated in areas that do get burned. The burns are, are very complete. The burning is at the same time as nesting. And then the return interval and so the return interval sort of matches up when, when the birds are there. So if you had all the birds concentrated in that two-year-old rough, two years post-fire, and you had a two-year return interval, then, you know, that's a lot of that's things right. that have to line up well, um, th- this for, is something for you to have this concern. And even then, there's there's the chance that the nesting and the burning just don't happen at the same time. Yeah. Well, Chris, it, uh, you know, as someone who, who constantly takes heat over this topic, I get asked about burning and nesting. I'm, most of the podcasts I get invited on, I would say. I, that was I a nice pun, by the way, Marcus. What's that? <laughs> I catch a lot of heat on this. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't even mean that to be a pun, but there you go. It works. Sometimes it happens. Uh, yeah, so I, I see the, the, vo- the photos go viral online and everybody gets really mad. And then they all throw, uh, you know, wherever they turkey hunt, on, you know, they throw the their management strategies under the bus because of the timing and then the one nest that goes viral and all that. So, and, and I think you did a good job of, of kind of laying that out, but one of the way, one of the ways I have presented that, and I just wanted you to kind of lay it out from your perspective. One of the things that I have commonly said is that a lot of the burning that we do at that time is, is it's often because we have a limited burn window and a lot of times we're behind on burning and we're trying to expand the burn window to increase the amount of acreage. And that often occurs in areas that have been out of the fire regime a little bit too long, which is getting into unusable space, especially for turkeys, you know, where they're you know, they were nesting and brooding and much earlier in the fire regime. And if we're five, six, seven years out, in most cases, we're probably already out of usable space for them. So can you just kind of talk about that for a minute from your perspective with all your experience with, with yeah. the data? Like, so, yeah, is that so true? The, you know, is that yeah, what you think? The, so the scenario I laid out where all those factors have, to, factors have to come into play, I mean, is there a place like that? There may be some places like that. They're probably primarily on public lands. Um, but I, I don't know of any place like that where all those things come together like that. Generally, we're not burning much at all in the landscape. We're burning tiny little fractions of the landscape. Mm-hmm. Even on some public lands, we just need to do more burning. We've already established that burning is really good for turkeys. Um, and, you know, and on public lands, in the defense of those public land managers, they have multiple objectives. They're not managing solely for turkeys. And so um, in many cases, they're managing for multiple species that benefit from fire. So they're trying to get their burning done when they can get it done. We really need to keep our burn windows open as much as possible. We need every day to be a burn day if possible. So if we start to restrict because we're worried about turkeys, we're worried about quail, worried about timber rattlesnakes, and the next thing you know, we don't have any burn windows. So it, mm-hmm. it's frustrating if we limit our burn windows because of these vast concerns. Well, and, it, and, it, and particularly if it's an area that is has not been in the fire return interval and we're trying to get fire back in it, and maybe that occurs during mid-April or something like that, people get really bent out of shape out of it for burning during nesting when it's a place that's not usable for nesting. Right. So again, that we need to burn to create yeah. habitat for turkey. So right. the turkeys so aren't actually, even nesting there if it's not habitat. So even, and it, even, even if even you, <laughs> it, it's a tiny, it's most likely a small percentage of the landscape. And then the last thing I'll say is, okay, yeah, we all know turkey nests get burned up. We documented a turkey nest getting burned up, but turkeys will re-nest and uh, they have a very high propensity for re-nesting. Um, mm-hmm. You know, some studies, you know, maybe uh, you know, very high, at least 50% re-nesting rate. So well, turkeys are evolved that if a nest burns up, they can go somewhere else, especially if you have that variability across the landscape where there's other places that have nesting cover, or if you're leaving unburned patches within your burn units where they could re-nest. Mm-hmm. That's a really good point. And another thing, Chris, and you can comment on it if, if you want to or whatever, but it's really curious to me 
that we have a whole bunch of bird species like turkeys and bachna sparrows and, and northern <laughs> bobwhites that nest on the ground in places that are super flammable during the time frame that they were really flammable and on fire all the time. Yeah. No, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. These birds are evolved to fire adapted systems, and they thrive in those systems. So mm-hmm. certainly, yeah, they they, Dur- they persisted the, with fire. Those... They persisted with fire millennia ago. They persisted with fire that was much more frequent and large scale, based on all the evidence we have. Yeah, and those populations. And were it co occurred with when they nest. Yes. Yeah. So that that does that is really curious to me. No, that's not to say that we might we may create conditions that are relatively unnatural. Uh, that could cause some issues potentially, but it is very eye-opening to think of it from the adaptations of those species in the systems that they they uh, develop those adaptations. Uh, it's really curious that they would still nest on the ground during that time frame when most of the fire apparently was occurring on the landscape, you know, across the landscape, but then they still do that. Yeah, I will say, you know, if you're a private landowner and you're listening and you're like, okay. Is it okay for me to burn during the nesting season? I think you, you need to think about all the things, all those factors I laid out. And if you're burning small units, if you really need to get some burning done, if you're burning at a time when the turkeys, you know, at a place and a time when the turkeys are not likely nesting, it's not a problem and you really need to burn. Um, you know, dormant season is a great option to burn if you can do, I mean, I, I love, I'm, I'm very supportive of dorm, dormant season burning. So we don't have to nest and we don't have to burn in April and May. Um, right. It's more about if you if you need to get more burning done and you know you don't necessarily discount that part of the burn window absolutely over that. not yeah absolutely and that's not. and that's one thing that I always want to make clear is the problem you know in areas where turkey's declining is almost never that there's too much fire it's probably quite the opposite that there's too little right. fire exactly there you go you've summed it up yeah. <laughs> all right that's we done it. here <laughs> that's it <laughs> he just nailed it <laughs> And there's just not there's just no scientific evidence to show that burning even during the growing season is causing large scale uh, re- reductions in reproduction. Maybe maybe there's a place and that ha- that meets all those criteria I laid out. And some researcher will go in and document it, and it'll be just mm-hmm. it'll be a cautionary tale. Yeah, and it just tells us that we need to know our focal species. We need to know the natural history of our focal species. We need to know how the vegetation responds to fire, and then we need to appropriately implement fire to benefit that species with with those sort of um, potential caveats of concern in mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, one of the one of the questions that I get, or I guess more of a, a comment directed at me, is that there's certain individuals that are tired of hearing it's worth burning up a nest this year in the promise of producing more turkeys next year, um, and and they think that that's never the case, but when we see this, these data being produced, um, you know, showing how limiting nesting and brooding cover is across the landscape, how strongly hens select for that combined with how much greater nest success and poult survival is associated with those areas. Yes, it is absolutely worth giving up a couple nests occasionally this year in the promise of more turkeys next year because would, we have data that shows it happens i would say giving up one out of 30 is a no-brainer yep but the the other thing i'll, I'll take that even a step further will a lot of places in the south at least are good brooding areas during the year of fire so you mm-hmm. might not even be giving up a year you may be giving up a nest uh, of eggs to improve brooding success from many Yeah. It's a good point. So, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And, and I've taken plenty of uh, peat, I think was the pun I used <laughs> earlier ago. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, over this topic. But I think that that's something that people need to, to stay in consideration. You Listen, know, keep, it's, it's a control. real thing. I mean, yeah. I was at a national fire training a couple of weeks ago and several the, – the, the eastern – most of most of the fire managers are Western, but the East, well, even the Western ones, I asked them like, what are, what are some of your major barriers to implementing prescribed burning? And, and almost to the T, it's a, it's some animal, and in the East, it's often turkeys because constituents for these public land managers are anti-burning because they perceive that, you know, there's some detriment from burning up nests when in fact we need to be doing more burning to benefit those same species. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's really, really interesting. 
it's definitely a divisive issue and you know we we have tried to take it directly on so hopefully everybody appreciates that out, out there and uh, yeah and you know i'm always open for questions or conversations i yeah and it goes and, for it goes for rough grouse i mean these things apply to any of the ground nesting species you know uh, mm-hmm. it, yeah, and especially I think it speaks to this issue at a broader scale when you look at the data that shows, you know, avian species across the board are, are generally declining with a few exceptions. I think like waterfowl is is one of those exceptions. Um, but when you start really honing in on the grassland and the shrubland species, you know, that guild is is in greater experiencing greater declines than any other. Mm-hmm. And this is a practice that maintains and creates habitat for those birds so i mean right then and there is your indicator that there's something that's lacking from the landscape that was previously there and and i think a lot of that is this disturbance process of fire well absolutely and here's some we'll use another pun here's something i'll get people fired up out there (laughs) another sound bite so to speak uh how, how many of these folks that are getting really bent out of shape about burning and burning during nesting and you know commenting on this and and everything online have a a bunch of soot on their hind end because those same people are hunting in these places in the recently burned area where all the gobbling is occurring and chasing turkeys in that burned area because that you know that we have very clear data to show that a recently burned area is a really good place to try to find a gobbler and I think a lot of these people are probably utilizing that and benefiting from it, from their hunting experience, and then at the same time really upset that we have potentially, you know, exposed the bird to to fire during nesting. So, you know, that's uh, something for you all to reflect on. That's a good point, Marcus, and it was one that I was kind of thinking about as we were going through this, if, you know... Knowing nothing else about the site, if you give me two pieces of public land that I have a choice to try to go kill a turkey on, and you tell me that one is burning a third of the uplands every year and another one is burning much less than that, I'm going to pick the one to go hunt that's burning more often. Every time. Ditto. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I have personally, and I think I even told you it was my favorite color, Will, that the the color of a really fired up gobbler on a backdrop of char. (laughs) <laughs> right after daylight and fly down it's a beautiful thing <laughs> is that a color well i don't we've we there is a color or a suite of colors associated with that but it's that that setting is a pretty special thing for me mentally well, fair enough i said my favorite color was iridescent <laughs> so <laughs> yeah well, I don't think people realize out there how difficult all this is, you know, to get on a microphone and be live when we're trying to go through all this. So yeah, I, I'm going to forgive you for saying iridescence is your favorite color. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. I was, I lost a little bit of sleep the past few nights thinking about it, Marcus. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you did. That's so what your forgiveness looking. is welcome. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least you didn't uh, lose your sleep over uh, burning during nesting. Right. Nope. <laughs> I'm not losing sleep over that. (laughs) No. Well, Chris, uh, is there anything, any other take home messages or anything you'd like to leave folks with that that are still listening? No, I think, you know, the take home message from all three of us is to get out there and burn, support burning. Um, Typically we're burning too little. So any sort of concerns about a lost individual are going to be much, much outweighed by the benefit to the population. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, like we said, everybody, thanks for listening. Thanks for helping us share this and rating. Uh, our, our audience has been so engaged in it and, and giving us so much feedback. We really appreciate all that. And please keep it coming. Uh, we're letting that drive some of the topic areas that, that we're covering like this one. We get so much, uh, so much, so many questions about this particular issue. So thanks everybody for doing that. Uh, Chris, we'll, we'll try to list all of these paper links and I know you have several of them. So we'll try to list all those so that people have direct access and can they, if they want to reach out to you with questions, what's the best way for people to do that? Yeah. Just send me an email. It's mormon at ncsu.edu. I'm happy to respond to emails and I'll, I'll send you guys the, the three, the three papers that I talked about in terms of fire and ground nesting birds. We have a fourth paper on turkeys that looked at 
in uh, pre-nesting resource selection. And again, fire was an important predictor, a beneficial yeah. predictor of okay. in, in, in habitat use before the nesting season. Awesome. Yeah, we'll, we'll include that one as well. So great stuff. Yep. One other thing I want to mention before we go is um, Turkeys for Tomorrow has confirmed that uh, for listeners that leave a review, we're going to start, you know, having a random drawing periodically, maybe once or twice a month. And we're going to send those listeners a TFT hat um, if they get us their information. So make sure you do that. And we'll start, um, we'll start drawing those names here pretty soon. Yeah. Maybe we could coincide that with, with turkey season. That'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thanks everybody for, for all your engagement. There's already a whole bunch of questions, Will. I don't know if you've gone and looked in our, our uh, reviews of the podcast, but a bunch of people already did that. So thanks. Yep. Thanks everybody. You're, you're helping us spread the word and we really appreciate that. Thanks guys. Thank y'all. See you. Wild Turkey Science is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network and is made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow, a grassroots organization dedicated to the wild turkey. To learn more about TFT, check out turkeysfortomorrow.org.